Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us for our webinar on getting results from your e-commerce platform. This is the Tourism Nova Scotia webinar series, and my name is Nick Fry. I'm the manager of business development with Tourism Nova Scotia. Some of you may be joining us and aren't familiar with Tourism Nova Scotia, and we are the tourism marketing organization for the province. We market Nova Scotia as a vacation destination and lead initiatives to help grow the tourism industry. Uh, COVID-19 and the related travel restrictions, of course, have had um, tremendous impacts on the industry. We wanted to offer this webinar series to offer practical information um, as we move through COVID-19 and um, prepare to welcome visitors um, when the time is right, you know, which is now to Nova Scotians and, and uh, down the road will be to um, across Canada and, and everywhere else. So um, we're open to going over an hour. So if you only have an hour available, that's okay. We will post a video of this webinar and you'll be able to go back and review. If you can stay, if we go over an hour, that's, that's great too. Throughout the presentation, um, we have a question and answer box on the bottom. So at the very bottom, just go in and add your, your questions um, throughout. And if something hits you later on today or tomorrow, just send us an email. And uh, really uh, looking forward to some great dialogue. Uh, if you have any questions at all, throw them out to us and I'll make sure that we get them into Arbuckle Media. So today we have uh, Arbuckle Media. Uh, we have Joel Arbuckle, the president. He began his career uh, after University um, St. Mary's with a degree in marketing management, sorry. He started to work as a freelance and opened Arbuckle Media in 2015. Um, our welcome media helps local businesses uh, use a strategy similar to big brands and uh, doing it in a way that fits their scope. Uh, the company now works with uh, local businesses and organizations of all over uh, North America of all shapes and sizes, deploying strategic branding that's scalable for businesses uh, to meet their organization's needs and goals. So really happy to have Joel here today. Um, I welcome Joel to take over the screen and share his presentation. Again, if you have any questions, we really encourage it throughout. Uh, thanks for coming today, Joel, and looking forward to the presentation. You are muted currently. Thank you very much, Nick. Um, thanks for the heads up. Uh, okay. Lots of tech. Oh. Let's see. All right, so can you all see my screen? All right, so. Um, Let's get right into it. Um, so Nick gave me a pretty great bio. Um, basically my background has been in uh, building websites and digital marketing since about uh, 2009 or so, not long after Facebook ads had an, uh, an ad product. Um, so I really, I started, uh, started uh, our vocal media after struggling to get an agency gig, um, put my resume out, had interviews, never landed a gig. So I just took the show on my own. Um, and since then, I've been working with clients all over Canada and the United States um, with all sorts of different tech. Um, I've really been focusing a lot more on e-commerce lately, especially over the last 12 months, uh, especially because of the situation that a lot of our clients have been in um, because of COVID, relying more on digital, um, creating strategies around digital, and um, just building better, uh, more independent alternatives for themselves. So. Fundamentally, I find my work is just like, a, um, I guess, akin to a, a doctor diagnosing uh, real pains, listening to symptoms, uh, looking under the hood at, at business statistics, and um, try and find a way that uh, we can treat those uh, real marketing challenges and, and uh, fundamentally business woes. So uh, this sort of webinar is, is informed by the trials and tribulations of both uh, tourism digital uh, adoption uh, program clients and our regular clients uh, that we've worked with throughout 2020. Um, and it's hopefully going to help you be, find more easy wins, um, become more independent from uh, third party uh, distribution um, channels and, and become more self-reliant on your own uh, data and knowledge base. So, Let's get into what this isn't. Um, so this isn't a 101 course for getting started with e-commerce. Um, we're kind of going under the assumption that you've already uh, been uh, turn, you know, turning that engine on or uh, deployed uh, some sort of e-commerce solution. 
Um, regardless if it's been successful, regardless if it's been consistent and regardless of your confidence level, this sort of assumes that you've already had some sales online or have been uh, doing some sort of digital marketing activities. Uh, so even if you're not quite there yet, um, you know, this is sort of taking things to the next level. Um, yeah, this is sort of, um, uh, standing on the shoulders of, uh, what other, uh, vendors have already had, uh, presented. So, uh, I'll, I'll be using Shopify as an example. Um, it's not going to be a specific presentation to a particular business model, um, or a specific platform, but I will be using examples like Shopify and, uh, and, uh, Google analytics throughout this, but you know, I'll try and stay as agnostic as possible. And like I said, this is more for operators who have already been selling online, um, typically with mixed inconsistent or even lackluster results. And it's great for teams that may have skills or expertise gaps, especially a lot of what we've seen has been, uh, teams that have, you know, owner operators or, or senior sort of, um, principals at the top. And then junior, typically younger um, marketing members or um, people that wear many hats, um, you know, in more of a flat organization. So what I ideally want you to walk away with is, um, you know, sort of the uh, an ability to look at a marketing report, just like I would as uh, someone who's in the discipline and adopt the language that I speak um, about marketing into your everyday business and behaviors. Um, I want you to be able to look at um, uh, a report and draw actionable insights, uh, choose, um, understand metrics, uh, KPIs or key performance indicators, and um, choose them correctly and appropriately for your business, the nature of your business. And uh, ideally avoid analysis paralysis. Uh, that's a huge theme. Everyone suffers from it. I suffer from it. It's okay. But um, hopefully these are going to be great tips to walk away without uh, succumbing to that. And at the end of the day, everything in marketing is related to everything in business uh, and everything in sales. So you'll hopefully see how they all sort of intermingle. Um, because with e-commerce, you have so much data to look at. Uh, there's really, there's no end to uh, how deep you can get down the rabbit hole of looking at behavior of analytics and reports. So let's look at how they're all related and which ones you can truly pick as uh, key performance indicators at the end of the day. So I think to make it a little more relatable, let's take a look at a couple of recent uh, cl um, client success stories that we've had. Um, both are product-based companies um, based at opposite ends of Canada. One is a, a sort of a pre-COVID um, uh, problem solution driven by buyer and retailer pressures. And the others is uh, decisions that were driven more so by COVID and local market pressures, uh, forcing them to think and launch digitally. So let's take a look at what they do, what their challenges were and what, how they've selected their KPIs and what those were and how we specifically targeted um, those KPIs with tactics and created some easy wins for them. So the first, uh, first up, we have a brand that we love to work with. Um, we're working with for a number of years since about 2017 or 2018 now, and that's only one treats. And they are a uh, single or limited ingredient pet treat company. So um, they sell ingredients that have maybe you know one to at most four ingredients in a pet treat. They're more of a premium operator now, uh, and they they were selling into uh, large wholesale channels like. Uh, TJX and uh, more regional pet chains. And because of pressures and, and business challenges, those relationships uh, created, fundamentally, they needed to go direct to consumer or D2C, uh, as we would say in the marketing business. And we accomplished that with Shopify. So I've been uh, with them since they launched their Shopify store. And um, you know, as soon as we turned it on, they suffered from an analysis paralysis. Uh, a lot of data. Um, starts to come in all at once. And all of a sudden they're looking at um, all their website analytics. They're looking at, uh, they started spending money on paid social media ads and building, um, building a community with organic social posts. And it was a lot for them to uh, take in without a marketing background. So, and that's what we see a lot of it. it. You don't have to have a marketing background to understand marketing metrics, but 
you have to have some sort of insight and direction in order to know which ones matter. So we still have weekly and, and monthly meetings to discuss different uh, KPIs, key performance indicators and, and how they're doing. And here's a great example of one challenge that we had recently. So Black Friday, as you all know, uh, huge, huge uh, in retail for any uh, vertical in retail business. Um, so what they were actually trying to achieve was a couple of things. They were looking to drive sales fundamentally, um, but they were trying to uh, shift the brand into more of a premium space and get away from heavy, heavy discounting and uh, also maintain the same average order value. You'll see me use this term a lot, AOV or average order value. It just means basically the, uh, the average uh, total cart size when someone checks out. Um, so that, that was sort of a, a struggle. Um, it's hard to, uh, you know, ask people to spend the same amount of money, but get less. Um, in this solution, we actually came up with the idea of offering zero discount, uh, across the board, um, on the website for the entire week of black Friday. Instead, we used free gift tactics, a tiered free gift system based on the dollar that you spend. And, and the results were astounding. Um, the owner of the company took a bit of a flyer on my idea. And in that single week period, they had sold more than the previous two quarters. Uh, so it was wildly successful. And at the end of the day, they were able to introduce a new product and sort of hit a bunch of different goals in one uh, sales scheme. So it, it was uh, great for them. And it um, maintained and, and even increased in, in, um, for that week, their average order value. So. It's sort of uh, honing in that one uh, or two uh, KPIs for this campaign particularly that really, really drove uh, actual tangible business results because uh, we knew what we needed to avoid and we knew what we needed to grow. So that's um, it in a nutshell. We'll get more into these uh, metrics and, and how they're derived and how uh, they are um, really how they're important to specific types of businesses later in the presentation. So another more local example was um, Petite Riviera Vineyards, a winery in the South Shore of Nova Scotia. Uh, so their, their biggest challenge was, of course, like many tourism operators uh, during the shoulder season of the, uh, the year, uh, COVID hit. So this was a deployment um, with haste at the top of, I believe, uh, March or April of last year. And they needed to get into the local delivery business uh, more so than ever. Um, if they had online demand, uh, they did not have an e-commerce deployment at the time, and they needed something with, uh, you know, they, they really promote their entire catalog of products, their product innovation, and their uh, contact uh, contactless delivery. Sorry. They also, at the same time, started turning on all faucets with paid social media spend. And we began to launch the store without necessarily having a, a full intensive digital marketing plan. But along the way, we discovered what KPIs um, mattered to them most and, uh, and really ways to monitor and report on them. So a challenge that they had was uh, with a winery, it's typically slower product innovation. In other words, they're introducing new products at a slower rate than say other alcohol uh, brands might like uh, breweries or cideries. Um, so one thing we looked at was product innovation through the, through using packs. So Petit offers store-wide incentives like free local delivery, like I said, um, with one competitive advantage, no minimum order value. As a winery does from time to time introduce individual new products, the team had this product bottled, labeled, stocked on Shopify just in time for Valentine's Day this year and uh, just in time for their Valentine's Day events and tastings. It was a beautiful, delicious chocolate port. Um, they even successfully promoted it within their email newsletters and ads. Uh, the problem, customers bought exactly what they were told to. They bought individual bottles. So uh, as you can imagine, it's not, uh, it doesn't make much pragmatic sense for a, a business to deliver no minimum order or especially uh, $20 orders when uh, their cost of goods sold or their COGS um, eats away a lot of that potential profit margin. So what we did next in, in just a week time, we actually introduced another new product. Very simple. It was a two pack of the very same bottle that just had been released. 
at a slight discount for buying two. Once again, customers did exactly what we thought they would. They bought the, they, what they were told to, far and away the greatest seller of that week. Uh, this time, however, the average order completely recovered back to where it was before the single bottle orders, and it made better financial sense for free local delivery and actually ended up driving the card value up even more um, and uh, gave the, the, uh, their brand managers a really a good example to stay in touch with with their, um, with their customers. So quick recovery, but it was because we looked at one KPI, which is out of average order value, which really, really ties into their cost of goods sold and, uh, and really, um, is sort of mitigates the risk that they take with uh, minimum or no minimum orders on their local delivery. So now we went through a couple of examples. I listed a couple of KPIs and metrics. But now we got to get into a few more in-depth examples of you know, how they're derived, how we know what to measure, and uh, how we know if we're even measuring the right things. So key performance indicators really sound like technical jargon to a lot of people. Um, you know, some people's eyes glaze over when we go in depth uh, on KPIs, but uh, they're really... Um, they're really a sign of discipline and making sure that you're focused on fewer things. So metrics and KPIs are often confused, but the clear difference is that KPIs are key measures that will have the most impact in moving your organization forward. They clearly articulate to everyone on the team uh, what your organization needs to measure and what you want to achieve uh, with your long-term business goals and objectives. They're often related, uh, often conflated, but they should never be interpolated because the key in uh, KPI is the true emphasis here. So less is really more with data. Getting yourself or your team too wrapped up in too many data points can take you off focus and thus give you analysis paralysis. So focusing on less, um, not too few, but finding the right balance of which KPIs and which metrics in e-commerce and digital marketing is it goes a long way. It, it really does. Um, every client has sort of had these same woes with not only not knowing how to interpret it, you know, what's, what's a well-performing metric, what's not. And there are so many of them. Um, we won't get through them all today, but hopefully the few that we go over will resonate a little bit with everyone here. So at the end of the day, you risk uh, wasting time and you create little or no insight without finding meaningful metrics and KPIs. And you also run the risk of uh, having very good results, um, which are just, just as risky as having bad results if you don't know how to properly measure them. And that's honestly uh, the thing I've seen a lot happen with, uh, with, with clients is uh, unsustainable growth. Uh, you know, very high peaks, very low valleys, very inconsistent um, sales periods or reporting uh, cycles and you know, without some sort of justification or insight as to how we got to those high peaks or those low valleys, uh, it's impossible and to, uh, to avoid. And history, really, history is really doomed to uh, repeat itself. So we get started with which ones should you choose? Um, what are the goals of the business? Uh, are they growth goals? Are you looking to acquire more new customers, for example? Or are you trying to grow loyalty and increase the value of existing ones? To choose the right KPIs, uh, you've got to be really clear on what those business goals are, and you got to effectively apply indicators by um, making sure that each goal is uh, articulable to everyone involved and measurable. Uh, the challenge is to establish measurable goals that are also realistic, particularly for brand new uh, or young products um, within your brand. And hopefully these tips will help you address this challenge. And another thing to take note of as well is stay clear of vanity metrics. Um, it's easy to fall into the trap of uh, the dopamine cycle of looking at vanity metrics, but they don't really add value. So take the number of followers, uh, top line followers for a social media account or all of your social channels, for example. Uh, while a fair amount of people might follow the brand, it, it doesn't really tell you all that much about how willing they are to buy or what the profit margin of those sales might be. Instead of measuring followers, you should choose a more relevant, helpful metric, such as, you know, 
how many of these uh, followers are actually taking action based on the types of ads you put out or the type of content on organic social channels that you put out. You don't want to track metrics as KPIs when they don't really move that much either. Uh, KPI is something that likely has peaks and valleys, needs to be reacted to, and is in some way um, moving the needle forward for the entire marketing department or sales growth of the business. Um, and a question I get asked a lot is how many should I choose? You know, if, if you're, you, I could probably think of maybe 50 KPIs uh, related specifically to e-commerce and digital marketing. And that's just, it's just far too many. It's just far, far too many to get um, behind. It's far too many to understand effectively, you know, confidently and competently, as I like to say. So I would recommend at a very minimum three, definitely no more than seven, but I would say the sweet spot is probably around five. It depends on the nature of your business. It depends on what stage your business is at, but in general, you know, it's probably a reasonable uh, goal to really hone in and track five and not only that, but report on those on a regular basis. So we've got one here. So the first one we'll start off with, as I mentioned earlier, is a metric called average order value. So that's really just your revenue um, over total orders. Um, so it's probably important for most businesses to consider average order value, uh, whether you're a value-based brand, you're more premium or luxury brand. Um, and you really know where this needs to be at a minimum if you know if you're well versed in your cost of goods sold or your COGS. Uh, it varies by industry channel and uh, it, it varies by device as well. So if you're more active on social and social ch channels that are more uh, mobile friendly or mobile first, you might actually, um, you know, want to look at those uh, by channel and sort of hone in on uh, specific ways to increase uh, tack, you know, uh, average order value by looking at specific device uh, tactics. So there's a chart here and it actually shows data from a 2020 e-commerce stats report. And as you'd expect, uh, in these examples, um, the average order values are highest in travel since these are generally larger ticket purchases like air travel, hotels, et cetera. Uh, there's a big drop off on mobile though, as you might note here, you actually have a significantly smaller chance of conversion, uh, for these on mobile. It's increasing over time, but uh, it's it's typical that higher value purchases typically happen off mobile devices, even if the first touch point of the uh, brand or the product happens on a mobile device. So lower average order values probably reflect the fact that people are looking to uh, do research on mobile and then convert with their credit card on a desktop. Uh, conversely, for retail and fashion, people are still spending more on desktop, but the gap is becoming much, much narrower over time. So when you think about how do I increase average order value? I mean, there's a ton of different tactics you can try, and it is depending on your pricing model, your marketing uh, goals and your brand goals. But ones that we've seen work uh, have been free and very common ones that are probably relatable to a lot of people here that they've seen, you know, they've either used in their business or they've purchased, um, uh, because of our free shipping thresholds, um, you know, free uh, shipping at a minimum dollar threshold, bulk pricing, buy more, save more. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, a free gift at a dollar threshold, uh, product innovation through packs. So in um, doing limited releases, I know there was a local brewery that did a limited release of a product uh, and it was a tall boy in a four pack. And the only way to get that new release was in the four pack. So you're sort of uh, forcing people to buy a uh, larger uh, order size just to get their hands on the, the, the new release, which inherently typically is more uh, attractive to your fans and existing customers. So they're also willing to buy a little bit more um, than more of an introductory offer. And finally, uh, upsell or cross-sell complementary products. So give your uh, customers on your website are looking for specific products, complementary products, 
or ways to buy things that they might like or, or give them suggestions. And there's lots of great apps and add-ons um, on products or uh, platforms like Shopify, for example, that help you do this really easily and natively. Um, and I find that that's, that can go a long way. Uh, just creating a, a relationship of recommending great items uh, to, to retailers, or, sorry, to customers through your retail OLED. The next biggie would be conversion rate. Uh, once again, important for most businesses. Um, it's typically, from a marketer's perspective, the number one uh, thing I will look at when I look under the hood of someone's Shopify store or someone's uh, Facebook ads manager account. It's the first thing I'll typically look at. Um, it can be indicative of a few things and help diagnose other problems, uh, typically on the website. So you're looking at um, probably a range of between two to 4% is sort of the average uh, safe range. Um, you'll see it, it varies by industry a little bit. Uh, and it's something that people often overlook, but the statistics are in and you'll see anything that's over 4% uh, is fantastic and important to sustain. Anything below 2% can actually be indicative of uh, other deeper problems like uh, bad UX or user experience on a website. And that really means that you're creating friction uh, for people to check out. Um, you're creating unnecessary uh, barriers or blockades for people to actually get checked out. Uh, and it's, uh, and there's a bit of a statistic here. So from emarketer.com, the most common reasons are hidden transaction fees and delivery charges uh, after having products at, in a cart, followed by people deciding to shop further or realize their chosen product isn't in stock. And one really easy one here is um, people deciding to shop further. Now your website should always act like a, uh, a linear funnel. Uh, you shouldn't give people outs uh, to go to other places on your website, to go to other places off site, once they've already put things in their cart and they're on their way out the door. Um, it's sort of the, uh, uh, the old rule in sales is, uh, less is more, the less you talk, the more likely the sale is to happen. And that's because, um, people know what they want and they're not going to, uh, enjoy rethinking or going back to the drawing board on what their order is going to be when they're already at the point of purchase. Not to say that impulse or add-on buys uh, aren't a thing on e-commerce, but every avenue that you add, uh, once someone has initiated that process of adding to cart and checking out, you inherently increase your risk of, of dropping a conversion rate. And you can try tactics like switching up the actual offers on your website. Um, you can try having specific, and I always recommend having specific landing pages or product pages for all products on your website. Um, auditing your user experience, actually going in and testing the site and ordering, you know, doing test orders, doing test bookings for appointments or hotel stays yourself on a regular basis, weekly if possible. And that's going to give you a lot because you're sitting in your customer seat at that point, clicking through your website. Uh, you're, you're adding new products or, or different offers that you've had to your cart, checking out, making sure that everything's uh, being caught because your customers aren't always going to tell you that there's a problem with your website. So discovering that yourself, nipping that in the bud may be a great way of saving, uh, saving a, a conversion rate from tanking. Uh, it's other close cousin is click through rate. Uh, you can kind of think of conversion rate as um, the rate of success on your website. And then you can think of click through rate as the rate of success of everything else everything not on your website. And that's because conversion rate, uh, going back to conversion rate, it's the total number of visitors on the website and the total number of conversions. And you can define a conversion however you like. Typically the most common uh, is, uh, is a purchase, like a, buying a pair of pants and, and checking out and having the order notification sent to you. Conversely, um, with click-through rate, it's counterpart, it's the total number of clicks uh, and a function of the total number of impressions. So you have, if, if uh, 14,000 people have seen your ad and you've only had uh, 70 checkouts, I mean, 
you can kind of see, or sorry, 70 clicks through to your website, you can give it an indicator of how your, uh, how your ad is performing or how the creative or posts are performing or emails are performing off the site. And you can also have um, wildly different results because the marketing funnel kind of have the, has those two big halves. Uh, click through is the top end of the funnel. It's the awareness driving traffic to your website. Um, you can have a very, very great click through and a very, very poor uh, conversion rate at the same time. Um, you can have the, the opposite can be true as well um, because click through rate is more tied to resonance of your ads and offers. Um, you can try things like uh, A-B testing your ads. Uh, A-B testing is just a fancy way of saying, um, you know, use two catchy headlines for uh, for your ads, um, in the, you know, with the same landing page, the same offer, use two different catchy headlines or use two different pictures or videos or a video and a picture. And you can kind of see which one over time, uh, once you've spent some money on them and, uh, let them run their course and get a sample size, you can see which one might generate click-through rate. And that needs to be documented as well. Um, it's not just the click-through rate, but what drove the click-through rate to be better or worse. Both are equally important, uh, and not only that, but click-through rate is important because it's uh, it can actually directly affect your what's called quality score on ad platforms such as Google AdWords or Facebook ads, and they often uh, offer a slight pricing discount for ads that offer a high relevance score. So what these platforms are basically saying is, hey, your your ads make our searchers happy, uh, so we're going to give you a slight discount because. Um, you know, these, they trust your ads, they like your ads and they buy your ads. Uh, so it's a win-win for both the ad platform and for your, uh, your ad spend or your marketing budget as well. Speaking of ad spend, uh, return on ad spend or ROAS as, uh, as marketers call it is, um, is basically a function of revenue, uh, dollars attributed to ads to ad spend. So this is a metric important for anyone doing any bit of advertising online. It's probably the quickest snapshot of performance uh, for all of your advertising, for all of your online advertising on a given platform. Uh, you look at it sort of as a function of each platform or as all of your advertising uh, digitally in general. Um, it's a quick way to sum up how your advertising are perform uh, is performing in a given period. Anywhere between two to four X is um, sort of a typical uh, range, um, you know, towards 4X is getting to great performance. Um, keep in mind, it doesn't account for COGS. We're not talking about um, an accounting equation here. We're talking specific about um, return on ad spend. So you wanna look at, for, uh, for example, if you have a 2X ROAS, a two times ROAS, um, you're looking at for every $1 you spend on marketing, you're earning $2. So that's a very simple breakdown. And like I said, doesn't account for your cost of goods sold. So you, you need to understand your COGS in order to better fine tune what your, uh, what a ROAS KPI um, would be for you and what that range would be. Because like I said uh, earlier, it's, it's, um, it is a, is a key metric to, to factor in, but also it's not going to be a definitive, um, I need a 3.96 ROAS. Uh, typically it'll have a range, um, because you're running multiple, you know, you're, it's a, it's a high level view of an entire account or an entire campaign, which may involve multiple products. So it'll typically be a, a, a range that you want to in, indicate with your, uh, with a KPI or a goal. And you can try tactics to improve ROAS, um, you know, clicking, uh, sorry, click through rate and conversion rate, um, are very related because if your ad is converting into clicks and it's then converting into sales, you therefore have revenue attributed to that ad spend and therefore you have um, a higher ROAS. So uh, making changes to click through and conversion rate, um, such as changing audience segments, testing different offers, promotions, or different ads um, can be way, one way to drive that up. And you can typically track that pretty effectively with a platform like Google Analytics um, and uh, tie that into whatever e-commerce engine you're using, like Shopify or uh, Wix, uh, Weebly, um, WooCommerce. And you integrate that with uh, Facebook Ads Manager and its Pixel. 
Uh, Facebook has a lot of tutorials out there to provide you with resources on how to do so. Um, but once you kind of set it, you can set it and forget it. And it's something that is constantly tracking so long as you're adding everything to the proper, um, spending with the proper account and your, um, your Google Analytics is live on your, on your e-commerce store. Another one uh, that gets asked a lot about and often gets overlooked is customer churn. Um, it's the customers who don't reorder or return. It's the, I mean, it's the exact opposite function of customer return rate. Important for businesses with, especially with uh, short product life cycles like consumable products or uh, particularly important for uh, subscription model businesses or businesses that have sort of a regular uh, base of uh, subscribers or memberships. Uh, you can stay on top of customers and create marketing automations um, that really will automatically uh, capture those customers um, based on when they've when you've last heard from them. Uh, so a great, a great way to easily mitigate that is to create special offers for different thresholds, different uh, points in that churn uh, or that path to churn, that unfortunate path to churn. And product innovation, uh, for example, can give you something to talk about or offer innovation can give you something to talk about with your customers um, with or without doing a hard sell or direct response style of messaging or campaign. You can also um, just have easy wins by staying top of mind. We'll typically um, turn down churn rate uh, as well as uh, we've seen in the past work is uh, deep discounts or customer satisfaction surveys will also give you an indicator and, and some insight into why customers have churned or uh, why customers have returned. So that's two sort of easy wins um, right there between staying top of mind and looking for uh, customer interview opportunities. That'll really go a long way in, in, terms, of, uh, in terms of mitigating churn to a, to a degree. So now we looked at a, about five examples of KPIs, um, how they're derived, what sort of insights they might give you. Uh, but how do we put that all together into something that the business can sort of uh, understand, um, something that you know, others in the team or outside of the marketing team can read? And uh, how do you explain and articulate what your KPIs and how they're performing uh, to others? So let's look at uh, the dreaded task of reporting. So reporting and reviewing it. Um, once you've selected the right KPIs for your marketing activities and e-commerce store, you should collect the relevant data and regularly analyze it. A good reporting uh, document includes uh, the right indicators and helps you spot trends from review to review. And the key here is a regular basis. So if it's, it's great to choose KPIs and understand what you wanna look at, but unless you're looking at that within a framework on a regular reporting period, that doesn't really do anything with a KPI. So you really wanna build a report that your team will actually read and use, your marketing or and or sales teams will actually read and use and keep it simple so that more people can get involved and you know spitball ideas or help uh, come up with great ideas for content or sales and, and make it inclusive as, as possible for everyone and, uh, and make sure that the KPIs are reiterated each and every time you have new members of the team join or uh, regularly making sure that these are, these are a good fit and that you're able to competently and confidently uh, interpret the metrics that you're looking at as it relates back to your KPIs. So each metric is different and really does deserve to be treated differently. And I think that's important. And what I just outlined is different metrics are gonna be more or less important depending on the type of business, you know, service, accommodations, uh, even value versus luxury uh, products are gonna look at different uh, uh, weight, weightings of KPIs. So make sure that that's also well articulated to your team uh, as, you know, in order, um, you know, using a numbering system in order, how important is each metric? You know, if you see a substantial uh, dip in conversion rate, I typically look at that, like I said, at the top, and if I see a sub 1% conversion rate, that means less than 1% of everyone visiting the store uh, converts into a sale. Um, that's honestly more indicative of the website performance or the lack of product innovation or offers than anything else. Uh, time and time again, I've seen that be the case. It can be 
indicative of other things, but typically those are the big two and the big ones to watch out for. So what does an effective, insightful report look like? Uh, it's not just a spreadsheet. It's not just a Google uh, sheet or an Excel uh, doc. Um, that's just data analysis and that's fine. And that's what goes into a report and someone has to look at that. Uh, but for the most part, other members of the team don't need to be brought into that fold. Um, so long as one person can go in and take extrapolate that data and put it into a report, that's key. Not everyone needs to look at a report because you just sort of get lost in the weeds. So once again, it's just data, data analysis. So really what in an insights report is, it's, it's the, providing the right context to that data. So it's numbers, I've defined it as numbers plus changes over time compared to marketing activities that drove the change. It's sort of an aha moment uh, that, that is really what an insights report contains. So it's real figures and it's a change over time and you always attribute some sort of activity, good or bad, uh, positive or negative, what went wrong or went right to that uh, change. Um, both are equally important. Like I said earlier, there's no sustainable business practice um, which has you know 10x growth um, in one period. It's not going to happen the next period unless you know why or have some uh, way to attribute that sale or growth over time. Uh, it's it's just not going to pan out well for the business uh, or the marketing team or sales team if there's no attributions. It's easier to convey to others when you're not just looking at raw data. You know, you can actually have conversations with non-marketers. Um, and I, as a marketer, may find it much, much easier to convey to my, uh, to my counterparts in other departments or in, uh, you know, non-sales uh, or marketing savvy um, owners or partners uh, that really don't care necessarily about uh, marketing KPIs, you know, someone in, in operations, for example, may not, um, look at this stuff regularly, but if it's written in more of plain language, less data, um, more sort of, this is my interpretation of the data, uh, it's going to be easier to have a real conversation and, uh, ideally provide steps on what to do next. Um, now you can see here, uh, this is kind of just a, uh, uh, random insights report I pulled. Uh, you can say my mess of highlights, both good and bad, the red and the, and the green highlights, uh, the dips and the uh, peaks uh, highlighted. And really what I'm doing here is I'm looking at, you know, substantial changes. You know, I'm not looking at, uh, I'm not looking at things that are less than, um, you know, a few percentage points of, of change unless they're a KPI. And then even then, uh, no matter what highlight I'm making, I'm always finding ways to attribute changes to some sort of activity or a lack of activity. If the team has missed something, if we missed an opportunity or a window to run a promotion or sale, at least we know, at least we're tracking it. We're creating a data point. We're creating some sort of insight into what the issue may or may not be. It may not be perfect. It may not be 100% accurate, but if we have some sort of foundation as to uh, what we're looking at and what we need to be, uh, what we need to be clear on uh, across marketing and sales, um, then everyone's involved and everyone can provide their own feedback and we can get to the root of the cause. But remember to keep the language simple and the references clear so that anyone can read the report within the organization. So once again, how do I build an insights report? Um, you take data uh, on your KPIs, you define a period of reporting. Uh, now your period of reporting, um, maybe I've used wow and mom. Uh, wow is week over week and month is month over month. So different metrics may move um, differently uh, over those times. It also may be that you uh, don't have the necessarily the time resources to do week over week reporting, which is fine because you don't want to get too granular anyway, unless you have a larger budget or more business and marketing activity. And you really need to attribute an activity, each one of them and highlight the substantial changes, good or bad. So a successful report really includes highlights, um, in chosen KPIs, both good and bad. It takes it a step further, providing analysis, um, you know, linking causation or correlation, uh, and 
without that, we're really just guessing. So let me give you an example of uh, uh, sort of a, a solid um, bit of insight. So in this, I wrote, we had an increase in total sales dollars uh, by 53% week over week. So that alone sounds great. It's, I mean, it's a great 50%, 53% improvement week over week, fantastic. However, without the next bit of insight, we have no way to attribute that somewhere. So what we've done is we've looked at um, what were the marketing activities? What were the business activities or sales activities that week? So in this week, we sent email blasts featuring our latest new product uh, this past Friday. Most sales, we, look, we can look into it because uh, we know what all of our sales contain. Most sales actually contain our new product and we had a high number of link clicks from our emails. So therefore, we can say that that marketing activity was quite successful in making that substantial change in uh, total sales volume week over week. So that's a direct attribution to a, a marketing activity. And we have real sales numbers as a result um, attributed to that. So then we can sort of step and ideally step and repeat that same process over and over. I mean, there's more to that than simply sending out an email blast. Um, maybe some email blasts perform better than others. But unless we're reporting all that and learning from it and making sure that we're regularly documenting those things, we just don't know. Like I said, we're just guessing. So that comes to sort of the final part uh, of the presentation, which is uh, what I call marketing process narratives. Um, you hear them a lot of manufacturing, even accounting, uh, other different disciplines. But I think that marketing process narratives sort of help bridge the gap, like I said earlier, between junior level employees and more and more senior, you know, management or owner operators. Um, it's writing everything down, everything that you do successfully and making it a process that you can repeat uh, time and time again. Um, so what are marketing process narratives? Well, we have KPIs earlier, we have reports. How do we sort of repeat and then scale those? Uh, so we set up a process narrative that tells team members how, what, and most importantly, I think why they're putting it together. A great way to provide references and direction, like I said, to, to more junior level members and make sure that everyone's on the same page and following the same procedures to make sure uh, we don't have more variables in successes or failures. And it gives a sense of why within a framework, I think is also important. So it's um, not only how do I do this uh, process? How do I do this marketing activity? But why am I doing it? And how am I going to draw insight from it? Obviously a con from this is it's very time consuming to sit down and document or write out uh, a lot of different processes. Um, but really a huge pro is that it creates an easy way to build and execute strategy because everything is document, documented, followed, and then it's adjusted based on how it affects key performance indicators. So these should be working documents. Um, they should be set in, uh, in place by uh, either junior operators who are documenting how they're working or by more senior level management who are documenting how they need things to be done. Um, and it's a great opportunity for uh, you know, keeping that learned knowledge in process development within marketing uh, activities uh, in the company, if say a great junior operator or junior team member moves on to another opportunity and you, or they're just not available and you need to sort of replicate those efforts. Um, they create sort of intangible capital uh, within, within your organization. So these should be uh, in the form of working documents um, and they should always be available to all the members of the team. Uh, you start them on a cloud service somewhere like Google Drive or Google Workspace. Uh, even Dropbox somewhere or uh, Microsoft OneDrive somewhere where at any point in time, um, especially now uh, where a lot of people, in, especially in marketing, are working from home, it's important that everyone share these processes and then adopt them in their daily use. So a shared process really just be, is a marketing process narrative that then becomes owned by everyone that uses them. And you're going to use these dev staff members, follow proper protocols, on uh, such as in the example here, adding products to a Shopify store, or you can create them for generating reports and making sure they're always looking for the right numbers, you know, always including specific metrics, always including uh, what uh, reporting period they're talking about and making sure they're always uh, adding plenty of notes and insights to each and every data point that they add. I mean, a great rule of thumb is for every data point, there needs to be one note. 
you know, one insight that's not just data that says, I think we got here uh, and this is why, you know, this is the reason why we got here. This is how we got here. These are the tactics we just tried and this is the result, good or bad. Uh, over time, all members of the team share in the learning. The process narrative evolves to become more adapted to business goals and KPIs. And your business has created its own knowledge base or internal wiki. I mean, you've the more uh, sort of data points, the more shared knowledge you have. Um, ideally, the more uh, power you have in creating your own you know, in-house marketing engine, or at least uh, you know in-house marketing uh, strategy. Um, and this creates an informed step and repeat process that your organization can then begin learning from all the possible data points out there without becoming inundated with irrelevant metrics or uh, succumbing to, as I said earlier, analysis paralysis. Um, you really create a fine tuned machine at this point. Once you've got KPIs, once you understand what goes into a, a good insights report, and once you actually uh, create a process narrative around that, to make sure it's step and repeat. It's the same things over and over um, with room for adjustments and room for uh, shaking things up or, or moving, uh, you know, moving KPIs or, or adjusting the weightings of those KPIs on, on a regular basis, uh, like quarterly or monthly. Um, but at the end of the day, it's those three things that really a lot of people uh, are missing out on with e-commerce. Uh, with digital marketing and they all, like I said, they all relate to each other. So we're actually putting a few uh, worksheets together as a bit of a homework exercise for everyone viewing. Uh, they'll be available for free um, and they'll include a, a process narrative framework for marketing activities, as well as a KPI kit or a cheat sheet uh, to help you determine and decide on which metrics you're going to set up with KPIs. Like I said, there's probably 45 or 50 um, that are really relevant to a lot of businesses uh, from the attendees, but it's, uh, it's important to choose somewhere between five to seven. And um, it'll be free on our website for everyone to download uh, later in the week. So um, hopefully that gives you guys sort of a, a starting ground to formalizing your internal marketing strategies to uh, creating better processes, more efficient processes when it comes to reporting. And, and hopefully it, it makes everyone more comfortable and uh, competent in uh, the marketing language that is uh, uh, our acronym uh, alphabet soup. Um, you know, a, a lot of times I'll catch myself doing it even internally with my own team, uh, talking too uh, high level about things or throwing out too many acronyms. And it does, it feels much better for me um, when I know that people are able to own the process and they're able to get uh, their hands dirty in the marketing, uh, department or, you know, creating content ideas, creating new offer product ideas, giving feedback on the website, helping triage issues, uh, with the website, more eyes, the better, you know, it's the more the merrier because you never know where a good idea is going to come from. Someone could have seen a great idea or come up with a great idea in the office department, in the accounting department. I mean, there's, you have to keep an open mind with marketing. Um, marketing is such a weird discipline. Uh, I truly think that anyone uh, is capable of doing it, but it really takes, um, you know, being comfortable with it and, and practicing it daily to get really, really good at it and to really own it. Um, you know, I've, I still find myself uh, sort of reinventing uh, how I approach marketing uh, on the daily. So. Uh, I think that's sort of keeping an open mind and, um, and, uh, but working within a framework and having a good base to go off of is, uh, is really important. Um, so yeah, I think that's sort of where I wanted to end up. Um, now I'll sort of open it up to, uh, any questions anyone might have. Um, I'm not sure I haven't been checking the Q and a, but, uh, hopefully we can look at, uh, if anyone has any questions specific to their business, maybe I can uh, spitball a few ideas with you. Oh, thanks, Joel. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah, yeah, coming in loud and clear. Perfect. All right, so uh, we have well, I have a question here, but I also have a question from Evelyn, and she would like to know, um, would love to hear more about how to approach attribution on and offline. On and offline, interesting. Okay, so there's a few ways of doing that. So. Um, without knowing, uh, I guess, what industry uh, Evelyn's asking about, um, 
I guess the, the big thing is um, creating ways to uh, looking at technology first, um, hardware um, and creating ways, uh, little wins, I guess, to track it um, because it will relate, uh, it will relate back to digital uh, eventually. Um, for example, uh, attribution for uh, a traditional ad um, could be sent through a uh, unique domain specific to that ad campaign. Um, you can also do this in the form of uh, customer uh, research or customer feedback uh, surveys. Um, you know, it's it's tough to attribute it one to one. It'll never be perfect, even in, in a digital e-commerce only uh, business. It'll never be perfect, but uh, the more uh, variables you can sort of close up, the better. Um, and getting that direct feedback from your customers is going to you know supersede anything else that I could tell you. Um, so I guess on and offline can be tough, but the only way to do that is to bring that into a, a really good insightful report. Um, and that way you sort of compare and contrast your e-com, your online uh, results versus uh, your POS results or um, find a way to sort of um, combine the two into one uh, ecosystem. Um, all right. Uh, somebody said they have to leave for another meeting. This was very educational and the information will be very valuable to their business. That was from uh, Lori and she's with Tipping Point Distillers. Um, Another one from Heather. Thanks so much, Joel. This was great. Looking forward to checking out the worksheets. So it looks like you hit the nail on the head with a lot of businesses kind of providing them relevant info. Mm -hmm. um, I said a question. When you were talking about doing A-B testing, um, in that instance, when you have two different pictures or two different catchy headlines, um, do they go to, are they sent to two different landing pages and that's how you gauge which one's more valuable or, or do they have an opportunity to click one of them or how does, how does that work? So, okay. So um, I guess the, the short answer is it depends, but what I would say, my gut reaction would be if you're testing for one thing, don't uh, include more than one variable. So okay. um, I'll give you an example. So actually this goes back to an example with an alcohol brand um, we were testing. So what we wanted to know is um, what, what gave people more, uh, we had some insight into the industry based on the NSLC's activities and how they market and how they discount. But we wanted to know, uh, for example, at what point or, or what, what, do, what uh, headlines will get more uh, click-throughs and what will result in more conversions. So actually in this case, we did an email marketing campaign, two random groups of our uh, newsletter went out and one had a, a percentage discount off and the other one had a, or sorry, no, one had a dollar discount off. So say $31 off. And then the other one actually advertised the price point. Price ended at a nine, nine. Um, and we actually noticed two different things. Um, at below a hundred dollars, the packs performed differently. I can't exactly remember uh, how it uh, turned out. I think it was the price uh, included in the headline uh, perform better when the price was below hundred dollars and when the price was above, um, the discount, uh, per, uh, performed better. So the sort of giving them like X amount of dollars off, if the pack was priced over hundred dollars that actually performed better. Uh, I, I could be, could be explaining that that was uh, without looking at the report, but that was sort of a, an example of how we just tested, um, you know, two different headlines. Everything else was the same. And I would recommend that be, or else you don't know for sure what the variable, um, you know, what the variable of success is, but that's sort of a, a real world example that I can recall. Perfect. Uh, just so if there's anybody else on the chat or Q and A that they wanted to send through, uh, another one from Andrew, thanks for providing this webinar, very informative. Well, this the accolades are just pouring in, Joel, so that's great, very positive. Awesome. Um, so yeah, that was my one question I had. Um, and, and I realized like a lot of the stuff I'm discussing, and it is tough for me, it, it's very heady. Um, it can be very high level. Uh, that's why I wanted to put together this worksheet with my team and really provide them, uh, uh, you know, some sort of jumping off point and whether or not they can do it themselves uh, internally or have the time or the resources to do that or the expertise or skills. Um, I'm not sure, but 
at least I can give them something that at least they're thinking about making these processes more refined, more efficient, and uh, ultimately more effective. No, definitely. Um, okay, well, I will just to let you, oh, uh, there may be another Q&A here, let me just see. Sure. Um, so this is from Siobhan Cleary. Um, we have had issues with online ads for alcohol. Have you had ways to work through this? Uh, I guess one question would be, Siobhan, just can you clarify what your issues may be? Um, if you want to add a little more to that, but, uh, yeah. Cause, uh, when I, when I hear that, the first thing I think of is, uh, it could be your advertising to the wrong people and you're, you know, uh, getting policy violations or something like that. And I have okay. seen those. Um, so, but it could be, um, you know, if you're asking about doing specific offers, um, yeah, it's kind of a broad question, but I, I guess one thing that I've, I've been doing a lot more of now is with, with alcohol has been, um, has been really uh, fine tuning what their pricing strategy is and making sure that's well um, brought into the uh, offer strategy. So those are two kind of different things. So if you're, like I said, with the email marketing, um, we tested different packs, different price points, different callouts and headlines, usually use the same creative uh, video or uh, photography and uh, always try to use the same lander. Um, we've done other things with, uh, you know, looking, we look at, the two big ones, obviously, as I mentioned in the presentation are click-through rate and conversion rate. Um, and there's different tactics you can employ. It sounds like she's more talking about click-through rate. Um, so I would try using she actually, uh, she was, uh, she was saying that, uh, care, uh, they're, they're always careful about age, but they sometimes are slow to get their ad approved Interesting. or receive approvals. Interesting. Um, so one thing that, uh, this might not be the most friendly advice, but like one thing is uh, sometimes an ad account that's spending a uh, smaller budget, say, um, I've seen this happen a little bit where they had been in review for longer periods um, because their budgets are smaller um, and more active accounts, I guess, sort of get the, uh, um, get the nod first, maybe uh, that's, Somewhat anecdotal. I don't have stats on that, but uh, that I have seen that in the past. So smaller budgets sometimes do take a little bit longer um, to get out of review or get out of the learning phase. If it's say on Facebook, uh, in the Facebook ad, uh, ads manager. Okay. Thank you. Um, so she said, "Thank you. That's great info." Um, any advice for a very small business on how to do e-commerce marketing without having a marketing team? having a marketing team. Uh, great you asked. <laughs> um, so without having a marketing team, you're going to have to set up. So you, you have two constraints then. You don't have the marketing expertise, it sounds like, or and or you don't have time. Um, you just don't have time or maybe you don't have a, much of a budget, but um, ultimately you don't have a time resource to put into uh, into marketing perhaps because maybe you're uh, creating the products or something like that. So um, in that case, uh, marketing automation can be your friend. I would not, I would be hesitant to, hesitant to avoid automations that aren't scalable or authentic sounding like, um, you know, uh, automating social media replies or comments. I would avoid those. But one things, uh, things that I would recommend are um, abandoned cart automations um, you know, things, uh, that, um, are really easy to just set and forget. Um, those are little wins that you can kind of come up with. And I think like things like, uh, um, you know, abandoned, abandoned cart checkouts, um, you know, regular, uh, setting a bunch of email marketing ahead of time. Those things can kind of go on in the background and they don't come off as inauthentic because, um, you know, it's, it's, you're not violating the laws of social media uh, with that. I would be more, uh, spend more one-on-one -on -one time with social and um, you can sort of automate with email marketing a little bit more. So that could be a little easy win um, for you on that, on that side. All right. Thanks, Andrew. Um, so again, uh, if anything comes up after the fact, uh, just send, send the email through to us and we'll send it over to Andrew. Um, I'm not Andrew, sorry, Joel. Uh, I'm still stuck on Andrew for the last question. Um, 
so again, if, if anything comes up and, and Joel's, we're going to share that um, the worksheets, uh, which are going to be available and um, this will be posted online. So uh, unless there's anything, any other questions that come in at the very last second, which I don't think they will, they're just saying thank you. So again, thanks, Joel. Um, yeah, thank you. So and we'll have that up uh, after the fact. So just going to take back over here. All right. So thanks, Joel. And um, we will share all the information um, when we get it um, uploaded. Thanks again for having me. And uh, you know, hopefully, um, anyone uh, sort of had a something that resonated with them. And uh, really, ideally, um, you know, if people want to reach out and uh, with more questions, uh, my email is on the website. Uh, it's just Joel at Arbuckle uh, and feel free to reach out and uh, I don't mind having a conversation. You can pick my brain about, uh, you know, little wins that you can make uh, more, you know, you get a little more in depth. I'd like to hear more about um, uh, specific challenges that people in the Q and A were asking about. Maybe they can share that way. So I would, uh, I would, uh, I would love to hear, um, you know, like I said, we work with both small and large companies, um, but really the themes and the pains uh, we hear across the board are very, it's very thematic. It's very, very similar, regardless of the size of the organization or the uh, vertical they're in, you know, service or product, et cetera. Um, everyone shares the same pains. So hopefully I can, I can relate back, uh, uh, you know, uh, what we've seen uh, move the year forward for them. All right, perfect. Thanks, Joel. So, uh, and uh, Jennifer just shared uh, Joel's email. So feel free to reach out and um, also ask any questions to ask for Joel. So thank you so much, Joel. And we hope to see you again in the future. Sounds good. Thanks again. Thanks. See you, Joel. See ya. All right, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, that was a really great presentation um, and webinar from uh, Joel at Arbuckle Media. We have another webinar coming up on Thursday, February 25th. This is Attracting Digital Remote Workers for Long-Term Stays in Nova Scotia. And that's going to be Thursday, February 25th. Uh, 10 to 1130 Atlantic time that will be delivered by Tourism Nova Scotia and M5 Marketing Communications. Um, spread the word. We hope that you can join us. Uh, look forward to that presentation. We also have Finding Your Find Your Ideal Customers Online. That will be Thursday, March 4th. And that will be 10 to 11 Atlantic time. That's going to be delivered by Kate, Caitlin Burgoyne in partnership with Digital Nova Scotia. Uh, and uh, we encourage you to um, join us for that as well. So, you know, we'd love for you guys to stay connected with Tourism Nova Scotia. We send out a in-touch newsletter twice a month. Uh, you can sign up at our website. We, if you have any questions or anything, uh, please email us at tnsbusiness at novascotia.ca. Follow us at Tourism NS. Uh, follow us uh, on our website as well. Um, or sorry, LinkedIn, Tourism Nova Scotia. Visit us at tourismns.ca. And we have some really great um, tourismns.ca slash coronavirus resources. So please join us. Um, love to see you. And uh, if you have any questions, again, email us at tnsbusiness at novascotia.ca. Thank you for joining us and have a wonderful day.